Sutra. Ananda, according to what you said, the mixing and uniting of the four elements create the myriad transformations of everything in the world. Commentary, Ananda, according to what you said, as you understand it, the mixing and uniting of the four elements, earth, water, fire, and wind combine to create the myriad transformations of everything in the world. Sutra, Ananda, if the nature of those elements does not mix and unite in substance, then they cannot combine with the other elements, just as empty space cannot combine with forms. Commentary, Ananda, if the nature of those elements, if the nature of the substance of the elements does not mix and unite in substance, basically the nature of their substance is not one which unites, then they cannot combine with other elements. The elements cannot intermingle and merge with one another, just as empty space cannot combine with forms. It is the same as with empty space, which cannot unite with things that have form. If there is a union, then it is not empty space. This contradiction is also evident in the nature of the elements. Sutra, assume that they do mix and unite they are then only in a process of transformation in which they depend on one another for existence from beginning to end. In the course of transformation, they are produced and extinguished, being born and then dying, dying and then being born, in birth after birth, in death after death, the way of thought spun in a circle forms an unbroken wheel of fame. Commentary assuming that they do mix and unite Suppose that you want to say that the four elements mix and unite. They are then only in the process of transformation in which they depend on one another for existence. They mix with everything and are subject to change. From beginning to end, they change and come into being, and in the course of transformation, they are produced and extinguished. Extinguished, then produced again and again unendingly, being born and then dying, dying and then being born, in birth after birth, in death after death, the way of the torch spun in a circle forms an unbroken wheel of flame. It never stops. Is that the way it is? Sutra Ananda, the process is like water becoming ice and ice becoming water again. Commentary Ananda, you should know that the true suchness of the self-nature of course with conditions, yet it does not change. It does not change, yet of course with conditions. How is that explained? The true suchness of the self-nature, which is also the treasury of the first come one, and also the real appearance, and also our true mind, is like water becoming ice, and ice becoming water again. It is like water which becomes ice, that is, it occurs with conditions, just as water can turn into ice, but the ice can also melt and become water again. I have often explained this principle to you. People's Buddha nature in the true nature. Body enlightenment is water. Affliction is ice. Your body is like water. It falls to everyone. It cannot harm people. Everyone needs water. You say, Dharma Master, I don't agree with the principle you are explaining. Why? Because a lot of water can drown people. You are really intelligent. You know that too much water can drown people, but when there isn't any water, can people die of thirst? So, water is necessary for everyone. Of course, too much of it can harm people. Is that why with anything, so much is harmful? If you don't eat, you get hungry, but if you eat day after day without seeds, see if your stomach has a place to put it all. Having too much is the same as not having enough. Eating too much is the same as being fiercely hungry. So, what I can turn into ice? I often say that if you were to pour, pour a bowl of water over someone's head, he wouldn't feel any pain, but if you hit someone over the head with a piece of ice, you certainly could kill him. A piece of ice can kill someone. A bowl full of water cannot kill anyone. Ice and water are actually the same thing, but in the form of ice, it can kill people, and in the form of water, it cannot. 
Because of this, affliction is compared to ice, body is compared to water. The Buddha's sutras say, affliction is just body. The ice is just water. There is no ice in addition to the water and no water in addition to the ice. The ice is in the water and the water is in the ice. Thus the sutra says, eyes becoming water again. But in order to turn your eyes into water, you have to develop a certain amount of skill. What is required? You have to use yang light to illumine it. And then the eyes can turn into water. This refers to our daily practice of sitting, of sitting in meditation and investigating chan that illumines our afflictions so that they turn into water. There is another bit of important principle I would like to explain to you now. This Dharma assembly we have convened is a subtle and wonderful one. In what way? I explain the sutras in Chinese. My Chinese is translated into English, so we explain the Buddha Dharma in two languages. But when you are listening to the sutra, regardless of whether you understand the language you are hearing it in, you should pay close attention. First, everyone who listens to sutras should thank Shakyamuni Buddha. Why? Because several thousand years ago, Shakyamuni Buddha spoke this wonderful Dharma, preparing a bright lamp in the dark night. For the sake of us living beings in suffering and difficulty, he spoke the Dharma in order to cause us to be able to leave suffering and obtain bliss, to be apart from the afflictions of this world, and to come to understand the way and bring forth in bliss. He spoke the Dharma to cause us people with a lot of afflictions, to be free of afflictions and to turn our eyes into water, so that we can return to the source to go back to our origin. And so we should be thankful to Shakyamuni Buddha. Second, we should thank the vulnerable, vulnerable Ananda. Why? Because if the vulnerable, vulnerable Ananda had pretended to be intelligent back then and had said, Buddha, you don't have to explain it, understand. Whatever you are going to say, I already understand. Then the Buddha would not have spoken the Dharma. He wouldn't have spoken the Suragama Sutra. It is not easy for us to understand these principles either. So we should thank the Venerable Ananda for having requested the Dharma beforehand on our behalf. He asked Shakyamuni Buddha to speak the Dharma for us. I have something else to tell you that that's not very important. What is it? You should also thank the Dharma Master who is lecturing the Sutra. That's me. Don't neglect that. I say it's not important it's not too important but you shouldn't look upon it too lightly either basically i am a dharma master who only half understands i don't explain the sutras well you say oh basically you can't explain the sutras well yet you have come here to explain them to us who don't understand the buddha dharma no wonder we don't understand what we're hearing basically you only half understand it yourself but if you can understand half of the Buddha Dharma, that's actually not bad. Why? Because the Buddha Dharma is as deep as the sea, you may want to understand it completely. But that's not at all an easy thing to do. I have studied the Buddha Dharma for several decades, 30 or 40 years, and yet I feel that I have not finished drinking a single drop of a great sea. Because the Buddha Dharma is so deep, so wonderful. That's why I said I was a Dharma master who only half understands, but you should say that you now understand completely. Because you are like the green extracted from the blue, which is to say there are top ranking students but no top ranking teachers. My master only half understands, but I, his disciple, have studied very well. That's the way you should talk. Lastly, you should thank the translator of the sutra. No matter who is doing the translating, you should pay close attention and listen, especially respectfully. You should be particularly attentive to every word and every sentence. Because I explained the sutras in Chinese and most of you don't understand it, 
it is necessary for you to rely on the merit and virtue of the translation in order to hear the principles of the Suragama Sutra. So you should be thankful to the translate, translator. Be very careful not to slight him or her. Why do I say this today? Because in the summaries I had to write, I saw that someone had written, I listen to the sutra here and I don't understand what the drama master is explaining and the translation isn't very good, so I'm not going to study here anymore. The person who wrote this is basically a very intelligent person, but unfortunately she tends to outwit herself a bit. Why do I say that? Because she hasn't any patience. When you listen to sutras, you should be patient whether you understand or not. When you remain in the Dharma assembly, you become permitted with the Dharma, just like the incense permits the air, then eventually the light of your wisdom will shine forth. The people who have become enlightened while is listening to sutras are many indeed. You shouldn't look lightly upon listening to sutras. When I was in Hong Kong, there was an elderly woman who couldn't listen to the sutras at all. She was deaf, but every time there was a sutra lecture, she had to come and listen. He climbed, she climbed over 300 steps to the temple, although she was over 70, and she came by herself. When the sutra lecture was over, after 9 o'clock at night, she would go back down all by herself, and when she got to the bottom, she would have to take a bus. She was deaf, so how could she listen? It was strange, but after he, she had listened to the sutras for a little over a month, she suddenly could hear the deaf woman listened and was no longer deaf. You hear this and think it quite profound, but actually it isn't the least bit unusual. It was simply that she was uh, sincere. Even if I can't hear, I'm going to listen, she told herself, and as a result, she could hear. So if a 70-year-old woman could have that kind of response, then if each of you is sincere, regardless of whether you understand or not, you will understand. Don't be afraid of not understanding right away. All you have to do is to be sincere and a day will come when you do understand. If you aren't sincere, you may say, I've been listening and listening and I don't understand, so I'm going to become one of the 5,000 who retreat. If you do retreat, it's because your virtuous conduct is not sufficient. In general, to be close to a Dharma assembly, you have to have virtue in the way. People without way virtue can sit still in a Dharma assembly. They sit and then stand and then sit again, and they're nervous and they want to go. Why? Because their comic obstacle ghost is pulling at them. The ghost says, you can't stay here, we are good friends. Let's go off together and create offenses. So you should be attentive to these four points when listening to sutras. In fact, you should not only thank the person who is doing the translating, you should be compat compatible with the, all your fellow students who are studying the sutra with you. Everyone should be happy. This is an important principle in listening to sutras and you should not neglect it. Sutra. Consider the nature of earth, its cause. Particles make up the great earth. Its fine particles make up most of dust, down to and including modes of dust bordering upon emptiness. Commentary. Consider the nature of earth. Now I will explain the element earth to you. Ananda. You should be particularly attentive. Don't be like you were before when you neglected somebody power and concentrated on being learned. Now I am explaining for you the basic doctrines of somebody power. Take a look at the nature of earth. Its cause particles make up the great earth. Cause means that for the most part, the earth consists of accumulations of dust bound together. Its fine particles make up most of dust. The smallest parts are most of dust, down to and including most of dust bordering upon emptiness. Most of dust bordering upon emptiness 
are the smallest particles invisible to the ordinary eye. They are neighbors of emptiness. They are more or less empty space, which isn't anything at all. You say, when the sun shines through a crack, we can see fine moths of dust dancing in empty space. That's something you can still see. A moat of dust bordering upon emptiness cannot be seen with the ordinary eye. Sutra, if for one device those fine moths of dust, their appearance is at the boundaries of form, then divide those into seven parts. Commentary, if one divides those fine moths of dust, their appearance is at the boundaries of form. Most of dust bordering on emptiness are the very finest, the most minute among things which have form. Nothing is smaller than they are. Still they have an appearance of form which can be perceived, then divide those into seven parts. If you divide these finest of fine modes of dust which border upon emptiness into seven parts so that they border even more upon emptiness, these divided modes are actually emptiness itself. Basically, there is no appearance of form. This is an explanation of the nature of earth. Sutra Ananda, if this mode of dust bordering upon emptiness is divided and becomes emptiness, it should be that emptiness can give rise to form. Commentary Ananda, if this mode of dust bordering upon emptiness is divided and becomes emptiness. Although most of dust bordering on emptiness are very small, they still have a visible shape. There is still something there, but if the most of dust bordering upon emptiness are divided into seven parts, they are truly and actually emptiness itself. Therefore, it should be that emptiness can give rise to form. Form can become emptiness, and emptiness contains form within it. Sutra, just now you asked if mixing and uniting doesn't bring about the transformations of everything in the world. Commentary, just now you asked, Ananda has just now asked, if mixing and uniting doesn't bring about the transformations of everything in the world, isn't that why there are all these changing and transforming appearances? So try, you should carefully consider how much emptiness mixes and unites to make a single mode of dust bordering upon emptiness since it makes no sense to say that dust bordering on emptiness is composed of dust bordering on emptiness. Commentary You should carefully consider, take a look at this, how much emptiness mixes and unites to make a single mode of dust bordering upon emptiness. When you divide a mode of dust bordering upon emptiness, it becomes emptiness. But to proceed in the opposite direction, how much emptiness must you mix and unite to make a mode of dust bordering upon emptiness? Since it makes no sense to say that dust bordering on emptiness is composed of dust bordering on emptiness, you should not say that most of dust bordering upon emptiness combined to make most of dust bordering upon emptiness. It is emptiness which must unite to make most of dust bordering upon emptiness. But how much emptiness would you say is, in, is needed? Would you use seven parts since one most of dust bordering upon emptiness divided into seven parts becomes emptiness? How much emptiness? This is what he asked Ananda. Sutra. Moreover, since the most of dust bordering upon emptiness can be reduced to emptiness, of how many most of such a form is as this must emptiness be composed? Commentary. Moreover, since the most of dust bordering upon emptiness can be reduced to emptiness, since when they are divided, when they become united with emptiness, of how many most of such a form as this must emptiness be composed? How many particles of dust make up the entirety of empty space? How many moles of dust bordering upon emptiness are united into emptiness? That would not be a small number. Here the word form is used to represent the element earth. Sutra, when these moles of form mass together, a mass of form does not make emptiness. When emptiness is massed together, a mass of emptiness does not make form. Besides, 
although form can be divided, how can emptiness be massed together? Commentary when this mosaic form massed together, a massive form does not make emptiness. You have been postulating that particle, particles of form unite with particles of form in order to make emptiness. But actually, a union of particles of form cannot make emptiness. Didn't the Buddha just say, it makes no sense to say that dust bordering on emptiness is composed of dust bordering on emptiness. Now he says that most of modes bordering upon emptiness cannot unite with most bordering upon emptiness to create emptiness. The most of dust bordering on emptiness have already become emptiness. How can there still be most bordering upon emptiness to unite with each other? When emptiness is massed together, Suppose you say that you can combine emptiness to get most of dust bordering upon emptiness. A mass of emptiness does not make a form. Since it is empty, how can it also have a shape, a form, and an appearance? Besides, all the form can be divided. When you have the appearance of form, you can divide it up into minute particles. How can emptiness be massed together? Since emptiness is empty, what method can there be of making the emptiness come together? How can you unite emptiness with emptiness? It has already become emptiness. Is it possible that you can bring the emptiness together further to form a mode of dust borrowing upon emptiness? Sutra, you simply do not know that in the treasury of the first come one, the nature of form is true emptiness and the nature of emptiness is true form. Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It occurs with living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. Commentary You simply do not know, Ananda, that in the treasury of the first common, the treasury of the first common is the true mind, the real appearance. You don't know that if you investigate the question of emptiness and the most of dust bordering upon emptiness to its primary source you still won't be able to resolve it. But the principle is found in the treasury of the first common. The nature of form is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true form. At its ultimate point, the appearance of form is true emptiness, and at its ultimate point, the nature of emptiness has true form. Basically, it is not defined, not pure, not produced, not extinguished, and it neither increases nor diminishes. Basically, it is unmoving in its basic nature, pure at its origin. It pervades the drama realm with nothing in excess and nothing deficient. The nature of form is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true form. This kind of wonderful function of course with living beings' mind in response to their capacity to know, in response to their capacity the extent of the wonder which each living being is capable of is revealed. Sutra, it is experienced. So whatever extent is dictated by the law, karma, ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. Commentary It is experienced to whatever extent to dictate it by the law of karma. It occurs with living beings' mind and appears in accord with the karma of each living being, in the amount of each is capable of knowing. The nature of form is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true form. Pure in its origin, it pervades the drama realm. This wonderful function follows the karmic responses of each living being and gives rise to the kind of retribution that each should receive. People in the world are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conscience. Who are they? They are people who cultivate according to externalist sects and provisional vehicles and ordinary, ordinary people. They are confused about the nature of the treasury of the first come one, which is pure at its origin and pervades the drama realm. They do not recognize it. They believe it is based on causes and conditions. 
This is the attachment of adherence of the small vehicle, the dharma of causes and conditions. All they assign is to spontaneity. Adherence of externalist sects are attached to the nature of spontaneity. How is it that they get treated in this way? These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, it is the distinction making consciousness mind of adherence of the small vehicle of externalist sects and of ordinary people, making distinctions and calculations. They make calculations with considerations and distinctions. They speculate about things which have not yet happened, speculations which are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. The false thinking distinctions and calculations of the conscious mind, whether you talk about causes and conditions or spontaneity, are all just words. None of it is real. There is isn't any true and natural principle which can be spoken.